Six more seconds. Good evening, good evening, happy Sabbath for those of us who are on this side of the world, happy Sabbath for those who are out in uh, East Africa, my homeland, uh, Kenya, uh, may the Lord bless each one of you and I believe you had a good night in spite of the pandemic that is wreaking havoc worldwide. We thank God for his goodness though and our hearts still go with our friends and relatives and even those who refer to themselves as our enemies for the losses we have had of life uh, because of this pandemic but i want to encourage you this is passing we will go through this by the grace of god because i am convinced and we have done through the study of the word of god it is not the final crisis but it is playing a part in preparing us for the final crisis and so i just want to take this opportunity to thank you and to bless god's name for giving us another opportunity to share with you from his wonderful wonderful word i have said this severally this is the most accurate account of our Acts history. And we have affirmed that from our studies in the past couple of um, weeks or so. Actually, we have done about more than 6,000 years of history. And today we will see where we are now and where we are heading to based on God's word. And so I'm so happy to and, and delighted at the same time to welcome you this um, afternoon or morning and uh, to pray that God may guide us and lead us and show us the wonderful things from his wonderful word in preparation for his second coming. Let us pray. Our heavenly and everlasting Father, Lord, we thank you for another time and opportunity you give unto us to read your word. Once again, Father, we acknowledge our nothingness and our lack of wisdom, and ask that by your grace, dear Lord, you may give us your Holy Spirit to be our guide and tutor, and that you may draw us into your presence, that we may hear your voice say, this is a way we okay in it, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, we are together once again. I cannot forget to thank you so much for sharing these videos. People need the truth. People need the Lord. And people are so duped, I tell you. God's children are so in darkness that I don't want to take a single minute with this truth any longer. I have apologized. I still apologize for not letting you know this earlier. I am so sorry I did not tell you. But the Lord has told us a lot of things and exposed a lot of things about our history. We don't need to guess at anything. We have a chart and a compass. And it is showing us the direction where we have come from, where we are, and where we are going. No wonder Paul said that we ought not to be as if we are in darkness because we are children of light. So when everything happens around us, in our homes, in our countries, in our continents, if we believe God's word, we will not be caught unawares. And this is the reason I am here today, once again, to share from God's word, to find out what is really happening. We read in the Bible, God making a claim that we have confirmed so far. He is vindicated. God is vindicated because he says he knows the end from the beginning. We have confirmed that. We have seen God giving us the secular history of this universe a thousand and more years before they happened. We looked at the book of Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter uh, 2, da Revelation chapter 12. We have seen that God actually gave us our history in advance. In other words, if you may remember the very first presentation I did for this particular series, sorry I didn't tell you, I mentioned that the prophetic message of scripture is history in advance. 
and secular history or past history is actually prophecy fulfilled. So it's very easy to confirm if the Bible is true or not. You just need to look back to your history and find out that that is true. And that's what we have done so far. And so I repeat for the sake of future studies that we have looked at seven kingdoms. God tells us that the history of this world was divided into seven kingdoms represented by beasts. Once they live their life, God was to set up an eternal kingdom of Jesus Christ, the kingdom that he has promised since the beginning of this universe. Let's go through the seven kings or seven kingdoms. Babylon, 539 BC. And then we came to Medopogia, 331 BC. Then we went to Greece, 168 BC. Then we came to Rome, Rome, 168, sorry, BC. And then after Rome, we had a little horn power in chapter 7, which represented peg, a papal Rome. In fact, the same kingdom is represented as a leopard-like beast in Revelation chapter 13, and that gives us the fifth beast. In our study on Wednesday, we found out that God introduces another beast in the book of Revelation chapter 11 and verse 7. And we found out that that beast from the bottomless pit, that satanic power from the bottomless pit, is actually Ephesian, that ruled over France during the French Revolution. They were the ones responsible with, for inflicting the, the wound on the beast of chapter 13, verse 1 to 8, to be precise. And so we have found six beasts so far. Today, we have looked very carefully this morning and affirmed clearly in our previous studies that the seventh beast or seventh beast is actually United States of America, which is brought about or talked about in the book of Revelation 13 and verse 11. And we saw that it was built upon a Protestant foundation because they came out of the persecution, they came out of the slaughter that was pioneered or what motivated by the teachings of the Roman uh, church or the papacy. But we also notice in chapter 13 verse 3 that they spoke like a dragon. This morning we looked very, very well, very, very clearly on how the United States had changed to that Protestant country it was in the beginning to something totally different, the direct opposite. And you have seen that now they are working in cohort with the same power they ran away from, almost going back to, to, together. And so if we look at our first slide, this will be a link point to our study this afternoon. We found out that the beast mentioned in this message in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 to 8, whose worship is, is enforced by the two-horned beast, which is the United States of America, is the first. Or the leopard-like beast of Revelation chapter 13, the papacy. The image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism, which will develop, will be developed, sorry, when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogma. And this is very clear, brothers and sisters. We found out that the beast of Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 is papacy. The beast of Revelation 13 verse 11 is the United States of America. The image of the beast is apostate Protestantism of America, which are now speaking the same language as the papal see. And this, I want to take you back to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Because I want us to understand very well. And I'm going to Daniel chapter 7 with this statement, or may, by making this statement. COVID-19 and the pandemic is not the final crisis. And that is biblical. It is just a catalyst to the final crisis. They are part of the things that Jesus told us to watch for. To know that the end of the time has come and his coming is drawing very nigh. Why do I say so? In chapter 7, verse 25 of Daniel, talking about papacy, the Bible says, And ye shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change the laws of the Most High, and they shall be given unto his to unto uh, his hand until a time, times, and the dividing of time. Verse 26, But judgment shall sit, and they shall take away that is dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. In fact, verse 27 says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. Two points. One, papacy will live 
until the second coming of Christ. The only thing, the only event that will take away supremacy from papacy is the second, the setting up of the kingdom of God. I hope that has sunk. And so it is going to be present with us in different forms until God sets up his kingdom. Second point, the final crisis just before that finishes with the setting up of the kingdom of heaven will be between papacy and all his confederacy and the saints. You ask a question, who are the saints? We have seen in the Bible, Revelation 14, 12, Revelation 12, 17, the saints are those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. I want you to see that very carefully. The final crisis will be between papacy and his confederacy. And today we learned about part of that confederacy, United States of America and American Protestantism. Maybe tomorrow or the day after, we will see other forms other areas, other parts of this particular confederacy. It will be a war between that confederacy with the Pope at the helm and the saints of the Most High, who are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Point number three, the final crisis is about worship. And on that crisis, middle ground is not an option. You are either with the saints worshiping God and keeping his commandments, or with the papacy, America, Protestantism, apostate, and every other form of religion worshiping the Pope or the beast. I don't think this has sunk. I don't, I don't feel it sinking in my own heart. So I'll repeat again. The final crisis is about worship, brothers and sisters. There is no middle ground. You talk to me about religions, you talk to me about nations, you talk to me about non-believers, atheists, Buddhists, Islam, Christian, I'm telling you, from the Bible, the final crisis will only have two groups of people. The saints who vouch for the keeping of the commandments of God and papacy and the whole confederacy of the whole universe worshipping the devil or Satan. In readiness and preparation for this particular crisis, we saw that papacy needed help from America and we will see today or tomorrow that it needs help from someone else based on the Bible. And so with that in mind, let's go to the next slide. When the leading churches of the United States uniting upon such points of doctrines as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy, and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. We have seen that God is warning us up from receiving the mark of the beast, whereas the beast is fighting very hard, together with America and apostate Protestantism, to pass the National Sunday Law. We are told that when that law passes, it's going to bring trouble. And it is not just trouble, brothers and sisters. I know COVID-19 has been a big challenge, but come with me to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. It says here, And at, the time, at that time shall Michael stand up, and the great prince which standed for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. He warns of a time of trouble such as never was. I am telling you, COVID-19 is trouble. It is a crisis. I am not belittling it. But that which God speaks about in chapter 12, that will be brought about by the passing of a law in America, and other countries in, on earth following the example of America will be so, so bad that it has never been seen on earth since that earth began. That's what the Bible says. The time of trouble that will be inflicted upon those who will refuse to follow the law of man will be too painful that the Bible refers to it as the time of trouble such as never was. And that's why we ought to prepare for that time by sinking the truth in our minds and loving Jesus more than our lives because we are going to go through a time that has never been seen on earth. I don't even imagine what these people will do to try and force the whole universe to worship a creature. 
I don't know. Because in the past, they have burnt people at stake. In the past, they have shot people. In the past, they have killed people. In the past, they have guillotined people. They have slaughtered people into pieces. And if the trouble that is going to be caused by their actions is going to be more than what has been, we need the Lord. We seriously need the Lord. But that time of trouble is going to be terrible for those who will choose to follow the Bible. Let me cut it or break it into pieces. The papacy has combined with America and American Protestantism and we will see that this confederacy involves even non-believers and atheists and other religions together to form a whole class of confused people, which we may refer to as Babylon, to wage war against the truth and truth lovers. And the Bible says for truth lovers, it's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. But don't worry, victory is on our side. And when I say our side, I mean the side of the Bible. And so we see, brothers and sisters, there's going to be a time of trouble, such as never was. And that trouble will be caused by the fact that these people are bringing about trouble upon earth because of forcing the world. It is so painful a trouble that God has to intervene to hold it so that you may listen to this truth. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Listen to Revelation chapter 7 verse 1. We read verse 1 to 3. It says, And after this I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. The angel sees, John is shown four angels who are holding winds, and these are winds of strife. We have just read that there's a time of trouble that is coming upon the earth. They are holding back that trouble for one reason. Verse 3, saying, Had not the earth neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. So why is God still holding back trouble? And don't get me wrong, I'm not belittling COVID-19, but it is nothing compared to what God is holding. It is nothing compared to what God has put in check so that you may listen to this truth. It is nothing compared to the trouble the devil is planning to put us into, lovers of truth. And for that reason, God is holding that in check, even today as I speak, so that you and I can study God's word and know really what his will is for you and me. The Lord is holding the wind. And why is he holding the wind? That he may seal his people. And so, America, apostate Protestantism, and the papacy are on the verge of passing a national Sunday law that according to Revelation 13, verse 15 to 17, they will force everyone to have the mark of the beast, which is Sunday observance by law. On the flip side, God is holding back those winds of strife so that he may put a seal on the forehead of their people. Don't you think it is important to know what the seal of God is? We have learned and discovered from Bible prophecy and truth that the mark of the beast is Sunday worship by law by legislation and i keep repeating that because no one has a mark of this right now even sunday worshiper god has his children in every church we will learn about that tomorrow but what am i trying to say brothers and sisters god also has a seal we just need to ask him what is your seal there for god like we did with the beast what is your mark the beast answered us so come with me book of um, deuteronomy chapter 6. deuteronomy chapter 6 the lord tells us something in chapter 6 of deuteronomy Let me just look for the verse. It says in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, Now these are the commandments and statutes and judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whither ye go to, pros to possess it. Verse 2, That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou, thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that they days may be prolonged. God says, these are my commandments, and these are my statutes. They are supposed to guide you, so that your days may be prolonged. Verse 8, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and thy shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Do you remember that papacy and the whole confederacy of evil powers 
are planning to force us to have a mark in our hands and on our foreheads? The devil is a copycat. Where did he get that idea? From God himself. And God is saying that his law is supposed to be bound in our hands and on our forehead or front legs. NIV says foreheads. Chapter 13. Chapter 13 of Exodus verse 9. Exodus 13 verse 9. Exodus, there we go, verse 9, it says, And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thy hand, and for a memory between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth, for with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. God's seal is his law. God's seal is his commandment. That is what decides whether you are God's or not. In fact, it's not hard to understand that because we read in Revelation chapter 14 verse 12, the saints are those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. The law of the Lord is his seal. His law, the Ten Commandments, dictates who believe in him and who don't, including the Sabbath commandment. But then what really is a seal? Let's go back to a slide. I have a slide of a very important country from prophecy now. The United States of America. The seal of the United States of America. A seal has three components. Name, title, and territory. In this particular slide, we can see the seal of the United States. And there is the name of the, the title of the president. And the territory is the United States of America. So we need to ask ourselves, what really is the seal of the Lord? And you'll find out that that is in Exodus chapter... We have seen the seal is actually the law. But look at Exodus chapter... 20 verse 8. Exodus chapter 20 verse 8. Chapter 20 of Exodus verse 8. My version says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember, brother, we have said a seal as the name, title, and territory of that particular seal holder. And the Bible has taught us through a few verses in the book of Deuteronomy and Exodus that God considers his law as a seal. His law dictates whether you are his or not. And he tells us to bind it in our hands and seal it upon our foreheads. His law. But we ask a question, what part of the law has these components? Title, name, and territory. Verse 8, I repeat again. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. We find the name of God in the fourth commandment. The Lord thy God in verse 10. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy maid servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger, nor the, that is within thy gate. Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heavens and earth and sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. In verse 11, we find his title. He made everything that makes him creator. So the fourth commandment does not only have the name of God, Lord God. It also has his title or position, the creator. Verse 12. Honor thy father and, mo and mother. Sorry. Verse 11. Sorry. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is them is and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God gives us his territory, the whole universe, heavens, earth, waters, and sea. He gives us his name, Lord God. He gives us his title, the creator, in the fourth commandment. Do you see how the fourth commandment turns out to be the seal of God? And do you see why the devil has attacked the fourth commandment specifically? Because it decides who God is. Look at Exodus 20, verse 12. Verse 20. Thirteen, verse 20, I think. Let me find it. I'll, I've lost that verse, but I'll find it later. What I, want you to, what I want you to see is that the fourth commandment gives us God's name, God's territory, and God's title. Just like a normal seal. And that is the reason why the devil has waged an attack on the fourth commandment. Such that not just the papacy or Catholicism, 
but even Protestant churches that were built upon the foundation of the Bible have refused the fact that the Sabbath of the Lord still exists. But it is the one that changes us. It is the one that dictates or decides which God we worship. Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. Look at Ezekiel 20, brothers and sisters. Come on, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12. The Bible says, Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. Verse 20 of the same book. And hello, my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. Sabbath determines whether you worship God the creator or not. It is the seal of God. And so on the right hand side we have the saints of the Lord who are worshipping God and obeying his Sabbath commandment as a seal that he is their God. And on the left side we have the papacy and all the confederacy of evil powers on earth worshipping on a day that they have created as his mark. Which side would you want to be brothers and sisters? Do you want to worship the Lord by keeping the Sabbath commandment? Or do you want to worship the beast through all the Christian confederacy by keeping Sunday, a man-made law? There are many even amongst my friends who think that the trouble that is going to come on earth will be caused by non-believers. You are wrong. The trouble on Jesus and his people, the suffering and persecution for the people of God in the end time is going to be done by the church. I said this in the morning. Look around you. Take a small recap on the past, brothers and sisters. While the slide is on the screen, do you remember that it was the church under the Pharisees that condemned Jesus and then the civil authority of the pagan Roman Empire through Herod crucified him? And do you remember that it is the church through the papacy, the papal power, that killed all the Protestants during the Dark Ages? They, the church condemned the Protestants the authority of the Dark Ages, either Rome or the Vatican or France, as we have seen in the previous study, killed the Christians. It is the same, same way, brothers and sisters, the church that claims to believe in God will have enmity towards true believers of God. And then they will relay them to the civil authority of the United States and other world governments, as we will see tomorrow, to be killed and slaughtered and murdered. It is the church that causes trouble. And even with this in mind, brothers and sisters, I still post this as a challenge in our previous slide. We'll just go back to the previous slide, please. I want you to see here in this slide, there are two groups. There is the leopard-like beast, which is papacy, the Roman Catholic Church leadership. And then we have Protestants with the Bible behind their back who have gone back to the papal power. And then we have the lamb-like beast, which is America. These powers and all the evils, dark powers on the earth, are combining behind the papacy to pass a Sunday law. On the left side of the screen is Jesus, and two tables of stone on the foreground, which represents the Ten Commandments. But most important is the Fourth Commandment. Are you going to choose to obey God, or are you going to choose to obey man? And I know this is painful for my friends who worship on Sunday. Sunday is not a biblical day of worship. It was brought about by the papacy. We have read their documents. They have acknowledged that fact. In fact, even Protestant churches have claimed that Sunday is not. And I told you, even non-biblical books, extra-biblical sources like Webster Dictionary still define Saturday as the seventh day. If you are afraid now to make a decision for God, if you are fearful now to make a decision for God, what are you going to do when there is death attached to the obedience of the Lord? Like the Bible says in Jeremiah, if you can't run with human beings right now on foot, what are you going to do when the horses come upon you? And, and I know how you feel, my brother, if you're a Sunday worshiper. I know how you feel. I love you, my friend. That's why I'm not going to keep this truth from you anymore. But if you cannot choose to obey God now, with all the truth we have learned, 
Are you going to obey him when they put guns to your head? Are we going to obey him when life, our life is at stake? This Bible is in my hand today in 2020 because someone was burned for it. The Lord is asking us to take a stand for him while there is peace. Now I pray that we find a place in our hearts to choose God. Because when we do, he will protect us. And so the war is set. The daggers are out. The weapons are ready. Roman Catholicism, America, Protestantism, and other organizations that we will see in our study tomorrow are joining hands in a confederate movement to crown the Pope as king with a Sunday law. And they will produce a law including a death sentence to anyone who dissents. On the flip side, God in his word warns us against accepting that mark and worshipping the beast. Because if we do, we will suffer the consequences. Are you going to worship on the Lord's day or on the man's day? And knowing that their time is very close, we saw this morning that already strategies are set. All churches in America are claiming they need to use the law. Everyone is wanting to go back to the same system where church uses civil authority to enact their dogmas. We are there, brothers and sisters. Watch this. In respecting religious liberty and the common good of all, Christians should seek recognition of Sunday and the church's holy day as legal holidays. It is time that we demonstrated or demonstrate our Catholic vitality and engage in the public policy debate. We have the power and the people to embark on this movement, a movement that will benefit all Americans. They know their time is short, brothers and sisters. And now they are imploring everyone in America who has a Catholic background to stand up and vouch for laws that will pass in the American uh, Parliament to legislate Sunday worship. For the next slide. The civil authorities should be urged to cooperate with the church in maintaining and strengthening this public worship of God and to support with their own authority the regulations set down by the church pastor. For it is only in this way that the faithful will understand why it is Sunday and not the Sabbath. Did you hear that, brothers and sisters? They cannot defend Sunday worship using the Bible. And now the only way to defend Sunday worship is civil authority. Passing laws that force everyone to worship on Sunday. The devil is at work, brothers and sisters. Christians are asleep. In fact, most Protestant believers are following these people without knowledge. And that's why I have asked you to share these videos. Dream about them. Send those dreams to people if you have the power to do that. Because people need to know the truth. Jesus is coming and the devil is trying as much as possible to push us to death in our ignorance. Look at that. The civil authority should be asked to cooperate with the church to maintain and strengthen this policy worship of God and to support with their own authority regulations of the church. Did you hear that, brothers and sisters? It is happening. In fact, why for this to be done, they knew something had to change. And so as early as 1991, Time Magazine, June 17th, reported John Pope, Pope John Paul II saying these words. On his tour of Poland in 1878, this should be 1978, John Paul II denounced excessive materialism and the separation of church and state. They knew that for the civil authority to support the dogmas of a church or enact laws that support the dogmas of the church, the principle of separation of church and state in America must be brought to a stop. And his call bore fruits. We saw that this morning. They bore fruits. In fact, if you want to know that they bore fruit, this is George W. Bush saying these words. March 22nd, 2001. San Francisco Chronicles, page A7. It says, the best way to honor Pope John Paul II, truly one of the great men, is to take his teachings seriously, is to listen to his words, and to put his words and teachings into action here in America. 
This is a challenge we accept. Did you hear that, brothers and sisters? From the president, he says it is high time we take the teachings of these people to hand. And we know their goal. Now I'm going to shorten this presentation by showing you a video, maybe a year or so ago, from one of a senator in America. In a few minutes. We know, we know very well where they are headed. Now the president says it would be good to apply the teachings of papal Rome in America. What really is their teaching? What are they vouching for? What is the real thing that the papacy stands for? Listen to this. In his sermon, the Pope said leisure was a good thing amid the mud rush of the modern world, but warned of the dangers of it becoming wasted time. Give the Sunday its Sorry, give the soul its Sunday, give Sunday its soul, the Pope said. The Pope was visiting Austria not only as a pilgrim, but also as a missionary. And at this time, 2007, Pope Benedict XVI used leisure, you know, to push for Sunday rest. Like it's just a family time, give us something in the law that protects Sunday as a family time, where we have leisure and we relax. Give the soul its Sunday and give Sunday its soul. But look at the next statement. Without Sunday worship, we cannot live. The same Pope. Without Sunday worship, we cannot live. The German Pope voiced a strong call for Christians to re revive Sunday keeping as an all-important religious practice. Sunday worship, he warned, was not a precept to be casually adhered to, but a necessity for all people. And how do you enact necessities? By law. So the papacy is pushing the same agenda that John Pope Paul started. To bring people behind them and pass a Sunday law to their advantage. This is just recently, brothers and sisters, 2015. Or was it? 2015, I believe. Pope Francis, in his encyclical, Leodato C, has these words. The earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. Remember... The previous slide, Pope Benedict XVI used leisure, family time, as a rationale for Sunday worship or Sunday law. Pope Benedict, Pope Francis brings in another side, nature, environment. And it starts with the words, the earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. On Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationship with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. Did you hear that statement, brothers and sisters? Now, environmental decadence, now, environmental problems, global warming and the like, are being pushed as a rationale, motivation behind a rest on Sunday protected by law. In fact, look at his word. He says, Sunday like the Jewish Sabbath. For those of us who have been listening to me know quite well that there's nothing like the Jewish Sabbath. The Sabbath was instituted in Eden before a Jew came to being. 2,500 years before a Jew came to being. Because the first Jew is considered to be Adam. I mean, Abraham. And so there's actually nothing like the Jewish Sabbath. But they like saying that because they are duping Christians to believe that Sunday is a Christian Sabbath and Saturday is a Jewish Sabbath. That's a lie. And remember the book of John 8, 44 talks about the devil as a liar and the father of it all. He says the law of weekly rest forbade work on the seventh day, which is true, mixing truth and falsehood. And so the day of rest centered on the Eucharist sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concerns for nature and the poor. Now Sunday is being pushed as a solution to global warming and other environmental problems. And if you have lived during COVID-19 times, you can see, we already have photos all over the internet of how the weather, how the skies are clearer in China, and how things are looking better because everyone is on lockdown. Sunday is now being pushed as a solution to environmental problems. How far is a Sunday law in America? I'm going to play this video for you. 
to listen. We won't spend a lot of time here. And I hope by God's grace you, are, you believe me when I tell you that there is going to be a Sunday law that will pass in the Americas. That Sunday law is pushed by the papacy, the dark forces of the universe, Satan himself. If you don't believe now, if you don't believe the Bible, or if you don't believe me now, please, by the grace of God, if this happens in your time, do not receive that mark. Die for Jesus. It will protect you. Now listen to this. Probably we should be debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday. That was Senator Sylvia Allen. Did you hear that, brother? Probably we should be debating a law that requires everyone to attend a church of their choice on Sunday. And this is a senator speaking in America one or two years ago. This thing is happening, friends. The mark of the beast is in the making. And when it passes, if you follow that law, you would have received the mark of the beast. You would have worshipped the beast and his image. No wonder God is giving us a warning in Revelation 14 verse 6 to 8, which we will read later. Do not receive the mark. That is a rallying call, brothers and sisters. I'll replay it again. Probably we should be run. debating a bill requiring every American to attend a church of their choice on Sunday. That was Senator Sylvia Allen yesterday talking about the possibility of forcing people to attend church. But today she was walking away from those comments, literally. You don't have any interest in talking about that? No. Thank you. Appreciate it, folks. Well, why don't you want to talk to us? Because I don't, don't talk to you. Thank you. you don't Bye. talk to me. No. However, it didn't take long for her to change her mind. About an hour after 3TV tried speaking to Allen, she took to the Senate floor defending her comments on religion. Last night in a very late appropriation meeting, and we were all extremely tired, uh, I made a remark about uh, America's in a need of a moral rebirth. Allen then said she couldn't understand why her remarks would be controversial to try to bring back this moral rebirth to our country, to turn our hearts back to good things. Did you hear that? Another rationale for a Sunday law is moral rebirth. America is on the downtrod. It is on the downhill as far as morals are concerned. A lot of shooting, a lot of problems, a lot of dark issues happening, and a lot of calamities too. And it is the right environment to call upon people to go back to God. And this goes very well with Donald Trump's call for make America great again. And you have seen Christian evangelicals surrounding him because now they have found an opportunity or they think they have found an opportunity to push the agenda of legislating laws that will force America back to God. And one of those laws is a Sunday law. I don't know whether you see that, that is some sort friend. Marks would be controversial. To try to bring back this moral rebirth to our country, to turn our hearts back to good things, that that is some sort of amazing thing for me to have said, and that would be offensive to people. Allen believes the country is heading in the wrong direction, and to prove her point, she told a story about her youth. I can remember, it wasn't until high school I understood there was anything like heroin, drugs. It just wasn't talked about in our society. It was a different time. People prayed, people went to church. Regardless, her initial comments spread across social media. And later, she questioned why her idea of legally requiring church attendance would even be newsworthy. I was chased across the foyer by a Channel 3 news reporter when I said I did not have any comments. Did you hear that, brothers and sisters? Probably we should be debating a bill. Listen to me, my dear friends. God's word will be fulfilled. I can assure you. In fact, if you have followed our studies through, there is nothing that the Lord has made a statement about. There is no word that has gone without fulfilling its purpose. A national Sunday law is passing in America, and that's happening pretty soon. 
and it is going to be brought about by Christians, people who claim to believe in God. But it is apostate Protestantism of America that will push American government to pass a law that forces everyone to worship on Sunday in support of the papacy. It is happening. And I keep repeating what God says in the book of Revelation chapter 14 verse 9. Do not worship the beast. Do not take his mark. Do not worship the beast and his image because if you do, you will suffer the penalty of eternal fire that is reserved for the devil and his agencies like the papacy. We have seen three major motivations. There are several, but just three for today. We have seen family time being pushed as an agenda or a rationale or a motivation for Sunday law. We have seen environmental decaying. We have seen global warming being pushed by these powerful powers on earth as a reason to have a Sunday law. We have seen moral decay in America. Bad things are happening in America. Families destroyed, children shooting children, people, they even with their parents in America, being used as a rationale for going back to God. And one of the ways of going back to God is debating a law that will force people to go to church on Sunday. Do you hear that, brothers and sisters? It is coming to pass in our own eyes. But the papacy's interest is not just in America. Now I want to read a few statements in readiness for tomorrow. Listen. The Sunday law will begin in the America soil. But it will spread out all over the world because America is a superpower. Everyone wants to be like them. It will go around the whole world. And this will put true believers in the Bible like you and I in a risk of even death. But don't worry about it. Jesus got your back. Don't even worry about it. Stick to Christ. Do not let anyone derail you from a thus saith the Lord principle. I've said this severally. That does not mean trouble is not coming. Trouble is coming, but God will protect us in his miraculous ways. It's going to be wonderful to be part of that trouble, I can assure you. I want to be there myself, by God's grace. And so we have seen the papacy. We have seen apostate Protestantism led by Americas and all the world. And we have seen American nation and other governments will come together in a confederacy that denies the existence of God and his law. The purple power needs more than just America and apostate America to have a global power. We know that in the 1,260 1, years, they had universal power. They lost it in 1798. The process of having it back began in 1929. Now from the clip we just watched, it is moving very close. And by that law, in America and other countries, the Pope is going to be put on a pedestal to be crowned as the leader of the earth, the whole universe, as we'll see in our study tomorrow. So what else is he interested in? Let's look at the next slide. This is Robert Mueller, a former Secretary General of the United Nations. He said these words, We must move as quickly as possible to a one-world government and a one-world religion under a one-world leader. Did you hear that? This is the agenda of the United Nations, brothers and sisters. You ask yourself a question, which is this one world religion and what is this one world leader? The United Nations is working towards a one world government, a one world religion, a one world leader. I can tell you it is a fact, it is published, it is available. In 1999, the World Church Council or the World Council of Churches and all denominations on earth, including Buddhism, all the Orthodox churches crowned the Pope as the leader, the spokesman of all churches or all denominations or all religious organizations on earth. That much is done. In fact, Protestantism followed. By 2015, they had gone to Rome and crowned him as the leader. So that's done. But look at this plan. The United Nations is forming a one world government, a one world religion, one world, one leader. Every religion on earth agrees that if there is going to be a one world religion, the Pope should be its head. We don't know about the governments or one world government. We'll see that tomorrow. Look at the next slide. In February 9, 1950, the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee 
introduces Senate Concurrent Resolution number 66, which begins like this. Whereas in order to achieve universal peace and justice, the present charter of the United Nations should be changed to provide a true world government constitution. So as early as 1950, they already saw the United Nations is not fulfilling its goal of bringing the world together into one government and one religion. You may have not known that, but the United Nations has two major functions, bring the world into one government, one religion, and one leader. I am so sure the religious leader is going to be the Pope. How about the political leader? We will see that tomorrow. Next slide. So they need a changes in the United Nations. In 2009, Benedict XVI said these words. Pope Benedict XVI today called for the reforming of the United Nations and establishing a true world political authority. My friends, this is the only thing that papacy is lacking. And it is going to start by the passing of the Sunday law in America. They want this world political authority to enact their laws worldwide. He continues, he wants a national United Nation establishing a true world political authority with real teeth to manage the global economy with God-centered ethics. Did you hear that? They need a little more TT, United Nations, because they are going to enact laws and to force people into things that are not biblical. They need that authority. Do you know where we are going, brothers and sisters? This guy is interested. This system is interested in world government. Next slide. Let's see what it says. July 1992, Time Magazine publishes The Birth of the Global Nation by Strobe Talbot, Rhodes Scholar, roommate of Bill Clinton at Oxford University. Big names, CFR director and trilateralist and appointed deputy secretary of state by President Clinton in which he writes, big names, he says, nationhood as we know it will be obsolete. All states will recognize a single global authority. All countries and basically social arrangements no matter how permanent or even sacred they may seem at any one time. In fact, they are all artificial and temporary. Perhaps national sovereignty wasn't such a great idea after all, but it has taken the events in our own wondrous and terrible century to clinch the case for world government. I don't know whether you're reading between the lines what I'm looking at right now, brothers and sisters. The last sentence. It has taken the events in our own wondrous and terrible century to clinch the case for world government. He's trying to say that events around us are vouched for a world government. I read this statement. It is, it's like he's saying, guys, whether we like it or not, we're going to have a world government. And you know, some people listen to such things and they say those are conspiracy theories. And that's all right. That's all right. But time will tell, brothers and sisters. These people know what they are doing. Listen to the next slide. September 23rd, 1994, the globalist, in other words, the proponent of a global government, the globalist realized that as more and more people begin to wake up to what's going on, like what I'm telling you now, maybe some of you are listening to this for the first time, someone behind the scenes has been strategizing for a world government, a world religion for ages, and they know this is happening. The globalists realize that as more and more people begin to wake up to what's going on, they have only a limited amount of time in which to implement their policies. Speaking at the United Nations Ambassador's Dinner, David Rockefeller remarks, this is a big person, everyone knows Rockefeller. He remarks like this, this present window of opportunity during which a truly peaceful and interdependent world order might be built will not be open to for too long. We are on the verge of a global transformation. I'm going to pause because I want to read that part very slowly. All we need is the right major crisis. Pause. This was in 1994, brothers and sisters. These altar boys of the Pope are saying that all we need is the right major crisis. Question, why can't you go to work right now? Why can't you go shopping right now? 
Why can't we do one, two, three right now? Why are you even listening to me instead of being at a church, congregating? We have created a new church on my couch. It's called the Couch Church of God. Why? Rockefeller says all they needed was the right global crisis. If COVID-19 is not the crisis, I don't know what is. Let's go back to the same slide. He says all we need is the right major crisis and look at the conclusion and the nations will accept the new world order. Oh man. It's like I close my eye for one second and I actually see Jesus coming. Time is up, brothers and sisters. Time is up. And I'm not saying Jesus is coming tomorrow or the other day. That's not my work. The Bible says we don't know the day. But he told us when you see these things happen, then know that it's very close. Rockefeller says all they needed for a new world order is a major crisis. I have never seen a crisis like COVID-19 all my life. I'm not too old. I'm approaching a half a century. I'm not too old. But I've never seen something like that. Is it possible that now these guys have found the right crisis to push the new world order agenda of a one world government, one world religion, and a one leader? And could this leader be the pope or the pope? I leave that question for you, brothers and sisters. But whether you believe it or not, look at the words of the next guy. These guys are serious. Very serious. February 7, 1950, International Financial and CFR member James Warburg tells a Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee these words, we shall have world government whether or not you like it, by conquest or consent. Brothers and sisters, the Pope is not only interested in America. The Pope is not only interested in a potent Protestantism in America. The Pope is interested in the whole world. He is interested in a global authority. And he's going to use bodies like American. He's going to use bodies like United Nations. He's going to use bodies like even the Muslim League. He's going to use organization worldwide. To make this happen and that system of body that comprises of believers and non-believers based on lies and pagan religions is referred to as babylon babylon is building up it is almost complete brothers and sisters and i want you to see one thing brothers as we close for today god told us all this in the beginning you only need to be wise by the spirit of the lord to see this happening in our own eyes. We now have a global crisis that will lead us to a new world order. That one I can say for a fact. I'm not so sure whether that new world order is what these guys are talking about, but I know that life is not going to be the same after COVID-19. And I know that control, human population control, is going to be easier after COVID-19. I know that a vaccine is at work. People are working on a vaccine. And I know that ID2020 have already prepared something to put into that vaccine to act as a digital identity for everyone. I know that human surveillance is going to be easy during this time. I know that control of buying and selling is going to be easier after COVID-19. I understand that the world will not be the same again, brothers and sisters. And that's why I've come out with a level of urgency to let you know do not receive the mark of the beast. Do not worship him and his image. Please, if you can trust me and believe what the Bible has said now, praise be to God. But if you find it difficult to believe what we have said now from the word of God, the identities of the beast and their plans for the future, when you see the Sunday law pass in the American parliament, please remember that the Bible warned you. We will read that verse as we close today. Revelation chapter 14. 
the message, this warning of the end time is referred to as the three angels warning. It is a threefold message that warns the people who live at the end time like you and me about this confederacy of evil forces working for Satan who wants to take reign of global authority to do evil things. And if it were possible, obliterate all righteous people and have the world for themselves. Because they still think that if there are no Christians on earth, Jesus will not come. But this world belongs to my Father in heaven. He took it from the devil by his death on the cross. Listen to this as we close. Oh, what a warning. Revelation 7, 14 verse 6, the Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of what this is my rallying call, brothers and sisters. Only him deserves our worship. Why? He created us. We are his by creation and we are his by redemption because it is Jesus who died on the cross to save you and I. Worship him who made heaven and earth. And we have seen a sign. He gave us the Sabbath worship, the seventh day Sabbath as a memorial for his creative ability. In other words, worshiping on Sabbath is a proof or accepting the fact that Jesus is your creator. Verse 9. And the third angel followed saying loud with a loud voice. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Do not receive the mark. Do not worship the beast or his image. Refuse by the grace of God. Stick to the Bible. Stick to the Protestant's foundation. Sola Scriptura. If it is in the Bible, I believe it. If it is not, forgive me. I will not believe it. By the grace of God, let that be our prayer. We are living at interesting times, and this earth is coming to an end at a speed that we have never seen. I don't know the time, I don't know the date, but based on Bible proof, it is so soon. May the Lord bless you for listening, brothers and sisters. And even more importantly, may the Lord bless you for sharing this message in whatever way. Join us tomorrow. As you look at the Babylon structure that the devil is planning to take into the last crisis with the true believers of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We praise your name for giving us an opportunity, Lord Jesus, to see our present day and what these evil forces are planning for the future. We do not fear the future because we are not of fear. And you've told us this truth that we may be informed in readiness to know that the crisis is ahead of us, but we are already victors by your grace and through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I want to pray for each one who has listened to this message. I want to pray for each one who has listened to the previous ones. I want to pray for each one who would choose or chosen or already to share this message. I want to pray for everyone on earth, Lord God. We have preached a couple of videos. We have put them online, Lord God. If there's your child somewhere on the globe, who will be benefited by this message, lead them to those particular clips, to the glory of your name. Now be with us as we close this Sabbath day, and that your name may be glorified for all you've done unto us. We choose to follow you, dear Lord, and leave everything to you. We know you will protect us. May your grace abide with us now and forevermore, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with us, and thank you for loving the truth. May the Lord guide you in making your decisions, for we ask in Jesus' name.